everyone. Also, if you're watching this later on Moodle or if you're watching it like in five years on YouTube, a welcome to lecture number two of the bioinformatics course. Today we will be talking about phenotypes, also known as traits. Um, so the whole lecture will be showing you guys or kind of explaining to you guys what phenotypes are, um, what different distinguish, uh, distinctions we make between different types of phenotypes. Um, so the gliederung for today or the overview is we will be talking about phenotypes or traits. Um, I will try to instill on you um, the knowledge that there is a difference between qualitative and quantitative traits. Uh, we will be talking about Mendelian traits and complex traits. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about statistical analysis um, and things like multiple testing. But last week we did a quick asking around and people said that people were aware or followed an SAS course or at least of some basic statistical knowledge. Um, I'm out of sync lip sync. Okay. Um, is there anything I can do about that? Am I in front or behind? Let me uh, check some of the properties. Um, let me just read timestamp it. Audio is in front of the video. Okay, it is a little bit slow though, the video thing. Um, let me see if I can fix that for you guys. So let's go to properties, um, configure video um, and disable buffering that should be okay so is it better now is it better now i hope so yes okay cool see so that's what the update changed then um so i updated the streaming software and it sneakily put on the buffer audio thingy um so it, it buffered the video and then it's behind all right good so if that's all fine um so um, since you guys said that you already had some statistical analysis, I won't be dwelling too much on it and I will just show you that it's important to do things like multiple testing. So when you're doing a lot of statistical tests then you need to compensate for that. Um, we'll be talking about phenotype databases. Um, so where can you guys get free phenotype data? Um, and in this case I will be focusing mostly on phenotype databases that are related to um, animals and humans. Um, of course, these same databases exist for plants as well, but since I'm not working a lot with plants, um, I'm probably not the best guy to give an overview of that. Um, but if you are working with plants and you think like, oh, I really want to know a lot of the databases that are out there, for example, for Arabidopsis or for um, Brassica rapa, um, then just shoot me an email and um, I can put it on the list so we can add it to the next lecture. Um, phenotypes will come back as well. Um, so um, let's just see how it goes um, and where I can fit it in then. Um, and a word about project planning because that fits in really nicely. It's one of the first lectures so um, if you're planning a project which for most master students generally not the case but if you're a PhD student you might be planning your own project. Um, so just a, a small word about that. All right so when we talk about phenotypes or trait generally we consider these things as classical phenotypes. So there's a distinction between what is called the classical phenotypes and things what we call nowadays um, endophenotypes. Um, so classical phenotypes are things like the yield, so how much potatoes does a potato plant make, uh, things like flowering time, like have from seed to first flower, um, how much time is taken by a plant, um, and things like human stature, so human stature is just how big you are, so height. And often, and that's one of the confusing things here, is that phenotypes are used as markers during breeding. So the, the word marker is generally reserved for genetics, right? A genetic marker uh, means a position in the genome that we can track and we can follow, um, or we can determine if someone is AA or GG, um, or AG for example. Um, but phenotypes have been used for the last like 500, 600 years as markers for breeding. So I, I, I kind of want to uh, go into that because phenotypes and genetic markers, they are used interchangeably as well. So first, 
why does a bioinformatician concern themselves with phenotypes and traits? Well, here we see a really nice example. This is um, an image by uh, Lemnatech. Um, so Lemnatech is a big company which does plant phenotyping. And this is the way that they do plant phenotyping. So all of the plants are in these little buckets. They're on a, on a conveyor belt and they are moved in and out of kind of a scanning chamber where every plant is scanned every hour. Um, so there's a lot of automation going on. There's a lot of data that's being collected. Um, and this is one of these kind of classical big data problems where we have five, 600 plants, um, which are videotaped and photographed and monitored continuously. Um, so this will result in gigabytes of data. Um, of course, all of this data needs to go into a database. And in the end, you want to say something about statistics because hey, you want to do some analysis and, and prove something about certain plants. Um, and of course, these automated phenotyping systems are not just there for, um, for plants, they are also there for um, animals. So we have mice cages um, where mice are tracked using RFID um, and they are videotaped continuously to see their behavior. Um, and then hey, that all goes into a big statistical model and then people want to prove um, something like, well, if there's a cat smell in one of the cages, then um, mice tend to not go there or mice tend to go there. Um, and then hey, you can do all kinds of experiments. All right, so big data is the reason why bioinformaticians are here. And of course, big data in this case means gigabytes of data. If you're just a biologist measuring like plants on a field and you have a very limited amount of plants and you only measure one thing, then of course it's not really big data. So hey, it's, it's really about the automated phenotyping nowadays where bioinformatics comes into play. Good, so first question for chat, just to see how much you guys know about phenotypes and about phenotypes being used as markers. So here we see a picture of two different types of cows and the question for you guys is, is what is the difference between these cows um, in relationship of course to their phenotypes? So um, I'll just wait a couple of minutes because there's not only a delay um, in me speaking to the camera, which we kind of solved, um, but there's also a delay, of course, in, in you guys having to think and type. All right, so Xanaxin, um, coloration of the hair and patterns. Yes, no, that's one of these obvious phenotypes that you can see, right? Um, so the, the one is black and white and has this kind of, well, Holstein-ish uh, pattern, and the other one has a completely uh, different color. Um, Sam Watts, color and pattern. Um, muscles, that is a answer. So very basically, right, if we think about cows, there, there's a phenotype of economic interest. All right, so the answer from my moderator is um, one is for milk and one is for meat. And here we see this really um, interesting thing, right? And this interesting thing is, is that um, traits, phenotypes, so things which we can observe, are used to kind of represent economical traits, right? We don't keep the one cow because it's black and white and the other one because it's nice and kind of one single color. We keep one cow because it is black and white and, and we keep that because the black and white pattern actually is linked to high milk yield. All cows which are black and white and have this kind of Holstein type pattern are high yielding milk cows, while cows which are more or less uniformly colored generally are cows that are held for meat production. So here we see this phenotype, this clearly observable phenotype, right? This, the difference in the colors, the difference in the patterns, and that is very tightly connected, correlated with the phenotype that we are interested in. In one case, milk production, and in the other case, it is meat production. So if we would breed two of these cows together, we would get offspring. And then just based on the color pattern of the offspring, we can already say if the next generation of cow will be suitable for milk production or if it would be suitable for meat production. And that, of course, is the phenotype of interest, right? We, we don't keep cows because they look beautiful. Well, in a way, some people do, um, but the, the phenotype here is that, yes, they look very different. And this difference is, of course, connected to the phenotype that we are interested in. All right, another one. 
what is the difference between these two types of potato plants? And again, I know that the color is different, right? I'm not colorblind. Yeah, that, that, that I'm not colorblind. I can see that the color is different. But what is the difference? Why would, would, would I, as a farmer, look at the color of the potato flowers and then say, oh, now I know something about my uh, potatoes, which, which is, is of economic interest. Right, we're, we're interested in economics, so hey, that's generally, like, you're not breeding potato flowers just because they're nice and white. Um, well, you could, but, but that's not really of in uh Vestkochen versus Melig, that is kind of the idea here. So when you see potatoes, right, and you see a potato field, and that potato field is flowering, and the field is white, then you know that these are potatoes that are used for human consumption. If you see a potato field and all of the potatoes are purple, you know that these are going to be used for producing starch. Because the, the, the color of the flower, so the, the purple color, indicates a very high amount of starch in the potato. So hey, here, the color of the flower is not really of interest to the farmer, but of course the farmer has an interest in either making potatoes which are suitable for human consumption, um, the right one seems to have more flowers and gluten. Um, I think the, the one is just a little bit zoomed in and the other one is more zoomed out. Um, hey, but the basic thing here is, is again, like as a farmer, if I look at my field and I see that the field is white, I need to call the supermarket to kind of sell my potatoes to the supermarket. While if I look at my potato field and all of my potatoes are purple, then I cannot call the supermarket because they won't take my potatoes because they're just horrible and I have to call a starch company which uh, things like the Ave Bay or um, big companies that extract the starch and then make all kinds of other products from it. So again had this this is called in in genetics terms it is called linkage. So one phenotype if the color of the flower is very tightly linked to the starch content of the eventual potato. All right. So when we talk about phenotypes, we have to distinguish between two types of properties, right? So we have qualitative properties. So those are properties which are observed, but cannot generally be measured with a numerical result. So qualitative properties are things like taste, right? Taste is very subjective to the one or the, the person who tastes it, um, and you can't really put a number on it. You can't say um, this potato plant tastes like five meters per second and the other one tastes like seven kilometers per second, right? That there's no unit to taste. So a qualitative property are things like, um, does it look good? Does it smell good? Uh, does it make me feel good? Um, so these are qualitative properties. You can put kind of a, a, a scale on there, right? You can say this one tastes better than the other one, um, but you can't put a real numerical uh, multitude or magnitude on there. So if we can do that, right, if we can measure something in a, in a quantitative property, um, then it is a property that exists and that has a magnitude or a multitude. So it is something that we can express, right, like the height of a cow. You can say this cow has a height at the, at the, the shoulder bone of like um, 1.5 meters and the other one is 1.6 meters, right? So we can we can exactly define uh, the quantitative property of height, um, but we cannot do this for qualitative properties. All right, so a little bit of discussion. Normally this we do this in the lecture, so it's easier, so anyone can just shout, but um, so let's just start at the top. So um, high fat milk yield. Is this something which is qualitative or quantitative? And um, just as a hint, there will be a question like this on, on the exam. And the exam is not so much about getting it right, but it's about your reasoning. So if something is qualitative or quantitative. So for high fat milk yield, just throw in chat, what do you think is high fat milk yield a quantitative or a qualitative property? Can we measure it in a numerical sense, or is it just something that is more like um, we don't know exactly, but um, uh, 
Ah, coffee. Ah. Quantitative, quantitative. Yes, Sam Watts, 21, perfectly right. Uh, Xanaxin, yes, quantitative. Um, quantitative property, definitely, because you can just measure the percentage of fat or the total amount of fat in the milk, um, and you can do this um, using real numbers, right? So you can just say, well, there are 500 parts per million fat in every milliliter of milk. Um, all right, so next one, meat structure. Is meat structure um, something that you can measure quantitatively or qualitatively? Should actually put a little music while we wait, like. Uh Or we should just put the uh, qualitative. Very good, Genie88. That is indeed a very qualitative trait. Although um, people are trying to make it quantitative. Because meat structure, um, yeah, like Sam Watts says, quantitative if you count the number of fiber. So meat structure is a little bit weird, right? Because in a way, um, you can say this meat is good or this meat is bad. And But nowadays there are machines which measure the marbling of meat. And the marbling of meat gives you a kind of an idea. You put it in an MRI machine and then you get the amount of fat versus the amount of lean mass. Um, and then you, you get more of a quantitative measurement. Um, so that, that that's really a discussion point here. But if you say it is a qualitative, then you can argue yes, because meat structure is something that for every person has a different uh, meaning. Some people like meat with high amounts of fat, um, and some people like very lean meat. And so if you argue like this, then it would be a qualitative measurement, and you could say, well, this is good meat because it has good structure. Um, but of course, what is good structure depends really on the person that's saying it. All right, so let's just go through the other one. Starch content. Starch content, of course, is a very quantitative trait. It is very easy to measure the amount of starch. Again, you can express it in parts per million. Um, wine quality is more or less the same as meat structure. It used to be a qual qualitative trait, right? Is, is it a good quality or bad quality? But since like five to seven years, the quality of wine is determined by robots. So robots just kind of sniff the bouquet and see how many flavonoids there are in the bouquet of the wine and then they give a score for the wine. So it, it is nowadays a quantitative trade while it used to be a qualitative trade. Like you used to have people who were vinologists, right? And they would drink wine and they would give it a, a score and then there would be a panel or a jury and they would decide on how the quality of the wine was. Flowering time is, of course, quantitative, very quantitative, um, because you can just measure it in the amount of days. And then, of course, race times are, again, discussable. Race times are, of course, measurable in a quantitative way. However, the fastest horse is not always the best horse, right? So depending on what you want, if you want to have like um, a horse which is good at stamina, then of course stamina and like highest top speed are not correlated. A, a, a horse which runs at like 50 meters per second is not per definition the best horse for the type of race. So depending on what type of race you're participating in, you could argue that and across the whole spectrum of races, um, for some races which are based on speed, um, then yes, if a race is based on endurance, then, then it is not really that quantitative. Although you could express it in a way, but here a lot of things come into play and it's not as easy to make it a real quantitative trade. So generally you would, would analyze race times, especially in like multi-day races where you look at stamina of Arabian horses, um, then this, this would be um, defined as being a trade which is uh, qualitative. So a horse is good or a horse is bad. So if I think about quantitative and qualitative trades, then of course all of the trades in the world that there are, right, the big circle, so everything can be given a quality score. 
right? Because you can have an opinion on anything, even if you can't measure it, right? So the, the qualitative traits are much bigger than the quantitative traits. There are more qualitative traits than quantitative traits because every quantitative trait, so everything that you can measure with SI units, you could also um, define this in a qualitative way. Right, so the, the, the quantitative traits are a subset of all qualitative traits which are out there. So quantitative traits generally are defined by the international system of units. If you can measure a trait by using the international system of units, then it is a quantitative trait. And a qualitative trait is a very subjective measurement which depends on the observer. And of course, in the recent years, with more measuring techniques, the quantitative trade bubble became bigger and bigger and bigger. So wine quality used to be here in the qualitative trades, um, but nowadays wine quality is in the quantitative trades. And that happens with more and more trades. So the more um, technology we get, the better we are in expressing certain properties of an animal or a plant in terms of the SI units. So besides having a qualitative and a quantitative trait definition we also have something which is Mendelian and complex so we say a phenotype or a trait is Mendelian when there is a single genetic locus or a single gene in the genome controlling this phenotype um, however we can also have more complex traits and a complex trait is defined by having two or more genetic loci in the genome which control the, the, the amount or the, the, the score that you give this phenotype so we will get back to Mendelian and complex traits. I just wanted to ask you a question, right? Because you're all scientists. So everyone is doing a master and or a PhD or a bachelor. Um, and, and what are the fun seven fundamental SI units? Um, and normally I would write it on the board and, and just write down what you guys answer to have an overview. But I will just take a pen today and just a piece of paper. And then um, I will just have you figure out the seven SI units. So um, just to kind of see how well versed you guys are in, in more or less basic science, right? So this is something that you should have learned in high school um, in either physics or in chemistry um, or some other like very beta field. Um, but just as a question uh, to you guys, so just throw in chat what you think is a fundamental SI unit because only when you know what the seven fundamental SI units are can you define what a quantitative trait is of course because so I'm just gonna give you guys some time to throw something in chat like doesn't matter what you think there are no right or wrong answers meters per second um, so meters per second are I would say two, right? Because you have meters, which is kind of a distance measurement, and you have seconds, which is a time measurement. So and the, the SI unit itself would then be distance, and on the other time, it, it would be time. And Xanaxin says uh, seconds, meters, and kilograms. So kilograms would be weight, right? So you would say that the unit is weight. Uh, matter for length. Yeah, so meters are, are a measurement of distance, so a length measurement. But then we still have three, right? So we have um, seconds, which is time. We have um, meter uh, or, or the, the, the distance measurements. And then we have kilogram, which is the weight. So those are three out of seven. So there's four more fundamental SI units that, that you can guess. So w what else um, do we use for measurement and, and can we use to define? Temperature in Kelvin, yes, very good, Xanaxin. Temperature is definitely as fundamental as I unit, and it is actually a property of an object, right? So an object has a certain temperature, and this, this temperature is, is something that you can determine. Ampere, very good, Bacon, very good. Ampere is indeed the speed at which electrons flow through a wire or eh, because it, it's connected to like resistance. But yes, electrons flowing through either metals or other objects is indeed a fundamental SI unit, which you can determine. All right, so then we're at five out of seven. I'm just going to show you the rest. Um, so we have length, which is measured in metre. 
uh, not meter like the English one we have mass which is measured in kilograms we have time which is measured in seconds we have electric current measured in ampere we have thermodynamic temperature so it's not really tem it's thermodynamic temperature which is of course measured in kelvin um, because that's always based on the absolute zero where atoms do not move then we have the amount of substance which is measured in mole and we have luminosity intensity which is measured in uh, candela all of these units, except for one, are invented by the French around the time of Napoleon. That's why I show Napoleon here. Um, so the only one which is not invented by the French is the thermodynamic temperature, which was done by Lord Kelvin or posed by Lord Kelvin. Um, and of course, Lord Kelvin um, came from the UK. Which you can argue based on like history that the UK and France, they are kind of the same thing in a way, but still very different, right? You can see France as the European part of the UK, um, but, but Kelvin is the only one which is not French. Um, so we can talk more about units um, and also these units get redefined once in a while um, because mass of course is defined in kilograms um, and, and it, it used to be defined as just a, a piece of metal which was stored at one of the SI uh, offices because the, the, uh, the system international um, just has offices around the world and they had like a, an example kilogram there. And nowadays the, the kilogram is defined as the weight of a sphere which has a certain diameter which is made out of certain atoms um, so these things get redefined but everything that you can measure in the whole world is a combination of these seven fundamental units and if you cannot express it in one of these units then your phenotype or your trait is not quantitative it is a qualitative trait good so Mendelian, I already said, one locus, complex, two or more loci, right? So, and of course you can mix and match these, right? So you can have a Mendelian qualitative trait or you can have a complex quantitative trait and you can also have complex qualitative traits, right? So it's, it's, it, it's two parts, right? So the one part describes if you can measure it or if you just kind of give a, 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 a subjective um, a subjective score to a phenotype and the Mendelian and complex is of course talking about how a trait is encoded by an individual so if it is encoded by a single locus or if it's encoded by multi load sign. So if we talk a little bit about the history of phenotypes and of traits then of course we always start with Gregor Mendel. Um, everyone I think working in biology should know Gregor Mendel um, and I just took a nice image of him from uh, from Wikipedia but he is kind of the godfather of modern um, genetics right because every everything which we know about genetics um, began with Gregor Mendel so Gregor Mendel has opposed his theory and his theory is that traits or phenotypes are inherited from the parents he also posed that there is something which he called gametes we nowadays call this genes um, so hey, gametes are things that are produced by um, hey, so, so men produce sperm cells women produce egg cells and these things contain something called genes and he imagined genes to be like beads on a string right so you have a little string of wire and the phenotypes are encoded on this string of the wire by individual beads and these beads you get half of the beads you get from your father half of the beads you get from your mother and so his theory is kind of fundamental because hey, even before we knew that DNA existed he already had this theory that there should be genes and he actually wrote down also all kinds of mathematical formulas which allows us to reason about the phenotypes of the offspring based on the observations of the phenotypes of the parents right so if if one of the parents is very tall the other one is very small then the child will be somewhere in the middle um, yeah, so a, kind of a mixture of the two and also this whole mixture to a mixture um, was posed by him so Gregor Mendel is more or less the godfather and he posed that there is beads that are on a string which are in which are in the gametes so in the sperm cells or in the egg cells and this is a very big step in or it's not the biggest step in genetics but it is a very big step 
because before this time the leading theory was the homunculus theory so that meant that people thought that there was a very very tiny person inside of a sperm cell so the women was nothing more than a vessel to incubate these little humans which came out of of men right so very man centric the woman had no influence everything come from the man so the hom homunculus theory hey, where you you can even see these old pictures um online if you search for the theory and then you see like this little sperm and then within the sperm you see kind of a little human being uh, which is inside of there and that was the idea the idea was that that the sperm of the male went into the female and the female was nothing more than a kind of incubator for the sperm cell a very interesting theory and this is a theory which which kind of throughout the middle ages was the leading theory of how humans were produced and how, how animals were produced. So, of course, Mendelian traits come from Gregor Mendel, and so a difference in a single gene causes the difference in the observed phenotypes between different individuals, and some examples of Mendelian traits are, for example, wet or dry earwax. So, if you would do your finger in your ear, which I can't, and then you can roam around and then you look at it, then either what you pull out is either wet or it is dry. And depending on that, you actually know the state of a, of a single position in your genome. So without having to use all kinds of machines and um, head sequencing technology, like we can already know something about your genetic makeup by just looking at the earwax that comes out of your ear. And based on that, you can say, well, you are definitely having a GG at this position or you're having an AG. And the nice thing is, is that this earwax thingy is actually distributed across the world because most people in Europe or from European descent have dry earwax, while most people from Asian descent have wet earwax. So it also, and the, there's also a correlation between this Mendelian trait and how it is distributed on the world. Another very common example is albinism. Um, so of course there are many different genes that cause albinism. But generally, the albinism is caused by a single mutation in a uh, melatonin gene. So hey, you have either a, a working gene or you have a broken gene. And when the gene is broken, you can't produce melatonin. So your hair becomes white and also your skin becomes white uh, or whiter than normal. Hey, and you, you also have red eyes because you can't make the pigment into your eyes. So albinism, although there are several genes which can cause albinism, Generally, the phenotype itself is determined by a single mutation in a single gene, um, shutting the whole gene off. And then, of course, the other genes in the pathway cannot fix this because this is um, a single Mendelian trait. Another interesting phenotype, which is um, also very Mendelian, is uh, brachydactyly. So brachydactyly is the, the fact that you would have six fingers uh, instead of five or, um, or um, uh, four fingers instead of five. Um, and so you have polydactyly and brachydactyly. Um, so uh, polydactyly means that you have more and brachy means that you, that you have one less. Um, so again, single gene, if it's broken, you, you, you just are born like someone from The Simpsons who has four fingers instead of having five. Um, and since it is Mendelian, if you have two people with brachydactyly, if they get children, then their children will also have brachydactyly because it's a dominant phenotype. And then there's the, the one that is my favorite, which is the ability to taste phenylthiocarbamide, which is found in high amounts in Brussels sprouts. And this is also a Mendelian phenotype. So some people, when they eat Brussels sprouts, they cannot taste if they are bitter. So phenylthiocarbamide is a very bitter substance if you have the genes to taste it. If the gene to taste this substance is broken, then you don't notice phenylthiocarbamide at all. So the reason why some children just hate Brussels sprouts and will never ever eat them is because of a single gene being well active in them, so not broken, meaning that they can taste the very bitter taste of Brussels sprouts. Of course, there's also some environmental influence um, because like based on if you're a smoker or if you're a non-smoker or if you drink a lot of alcohol, um, 
you can modify the ability to taste this substance um, but on a very basic level there's a single gene which controls your ability to taste it yes or no and if this gene is broken you cannot taste it and you don't have any qualms with Brussels sprouts because you don't think that they are bitter. All right, so when we talk about Mendelian traits, um, we always show these kinds of uh, cross diagrams and um, I just wanted to kind of explain to you guys how this works. Um, I bet that many people saw them before. So if you if you know what kind of a, what a cross diagram is, then hey, just say in chat, I've seen this before, I know how this works. Um, but we'll just go through it because you can make them as complex as you want and we will start making them very complex. So I just want people to understand kind of the basics of this. Right, so what we are seeing here is we are having a maternal individual, right? So the mother and we have the paternal individual, which is the father. Right, so in this case, our mother is a heterozygous individual. So the genome of the mother, because everyone, or since we are diploid organisms, we have two copies of each chromosome. Um, so our mother in this case has a, a big A chromosome and has a small A chromosome. So one of the chromosomes inherited from her mother, one of the chromosomes inherited from her father. On the paternal side, we have the same, right? So we have a, a father who is also um, big A, small A. And then of course we can do the cross diagram and the cross diagram means that we're just going to say, well, what type of offspring can these two people produce together, right? So if, if the maternal side is heterozygous AA and the paternal side is heterozygous AA, then of course there's a 25% chance that the children will be big A, big A there's a 25% chance that the, the children will get the small a from their mother and the big a from their father. There's of course a 25% chance that the opposite happens. So hey, you get from your mother the big a and from your father the small a. And of course there's also a 25% chance that you get two small a's. So a small a from your mother and a small a from your father. So as I already said, the, the, the the state in which you have two different chromosomes is called heterozygous. So just a definition thing. So we call a uh, small a big A heterozygous, but we also call the opposite heterozygous. So we call AA as well as small a big A heterozygous. And there's many different ways that people encode these things. So generally we use uh, big letters, small letters, um, but you can also use a single letter um, with a little plus. So you can have like J plus, J minus, and we mean the same thing by that. That just means that on one chromosome the gene is plus, meaning that it's that it's that it works, and on the other chromosome you have J minus, meaning that the gene doesn't work. So these cross diagrams will come back because they are very very fundamental to genetics. So I just wanted to explain to you how it works. Do remember that in genetics females go before males. So if you write AA, it means mother father. So the, the big A comes from the mother, the small A comes from the father. So that is a definition that we agreed upon in genetics. Um, so adhere to that because otherwise you're just writing it the opposite way. And there can be phenotypic differences uh, between individuals getting an A, small A from their mother versus individuals getting a small A from the father. And we call this parent of origin effects. So parent of origin effects is when the, the phenotype of the individual carrying the maternal A, maternal small A is different from when the individual is carrying the paternal small A phenotype. All right, so I think everyone knows this, right? So um, I'm just wanting to show. So here we have again the cross diagram, um, and now I actually colored the uh, gametes differently, right? So I, I just made like little flowers here, and there are several situations, right? So we can have the and when we take two flowers, so we take a flower that has a, a white allele and a red allele, and we take another flower which also has a white allele and a red allele, and now we start mixing them, right? So we, we cross these two flowers together. Then if this is the resulting situation, so if we take like a hundred offspring and we see that 25% of the offspring are white, 25% of the offspring are red, and we see that 50% of the offspring are kind of a mixture, right, between the two colors, like pinkish, um, then we call this an additive phenotype. 
So this phenotype is called additive. Why? Because both parental genomes kind of contribute, right? And they mix together. So that that's a it's a mixture. Besides the mixture, we also have a dominant slash recessive phenotype, right? So here is an example where the red phenotype, so the the red um, coloring is dominant over the white coloring. Yeah, so when we then do the cross between these parents, um, then what do we see? Well, we see that only 25% of the offspring will be white, while 75% of the offspring will be red, right? So if you have an allele which is coding for white and you have an allele which is coding for red, then your phenotype will be red. All right, is this clear? Just say yes or no or something like that because this is very fundamental and I will start asking questions about it um, because it is important and we will start expanding it. We won't be just talking about a single locus but also two loci and then three loci uh, because that's very fundamental in genetics. So um, just give me a little bit of feedback. Just say, yeah, I understand. I know now what an additive phenotype is um, or I know now and I understand what, what dominance is. Just do the cricket sound until someone answers. Um, nah, I won't do the cricket sound. I won't annoy you guys with, with crickets all the time. All right. No answer means yes, right? That's always the case. So if you have no questions and this just then I assume. So if no one says something, what is the difference between allele and gene? That is very fundamental, or that is difficult, but it's a very, very good question somewhat because an allele is generally the state of a piece of DNA, while a gene is something that you get inherited from your parents, right? It, but in, 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 uh, so in genetics, a gene is a unit of inheritance, so something which is inherited. And this, this gene can come in different states, right? You can have the, the white gene and the red gene. And we call this alleles of the gene. So a gene can have a white allele and a red allele. So it's the same gene, but it comes in two different forms. And indeed, I kind of use it sometimes interchangeably. And of course, when you talk about gene in a molecular biology sense, gene again means something relatively different because then a gene is something which has introns and exons and codes for a protein which is on the DNA. But in genetics, a gene very basically is defined as a unit of inheritance. So something which is inherited and that can have different alleles. So it can be in the white state or it can be in the red state or it can be in a purple state. And so you can have all kinds of different alleles of the same gene. Is that clear? I hope it is clear. Good, then we move on to my first question about Mendelian traits. And a lot of people know these diagrams, but I never saw someone that asks you how the parents look. So how does the mother look here? Right, so we have a phenotype which is additive. How does the mother look when the mother has the white and the red allele? I am going with the cricket sound now, at least in my head. So I'm not going to bother you with it, but right. And this is one of these trick questions that you probably will get on the exam. Well, not this exact question, but it is, it is like it is, hey, you know now what additive phenotypes are. It's very clear from the crossing scheme that it is additive. So a very basic question would be, how does the parent look? So what color does the mother have? Don't be scared, there are no wrong answers. Well, there are, but I don't care about wrong answers. An answer is better than, than, than no answer. <laughs> yeah, this does work better in a classroom where I can just point at someone and say, uh, Beacon, what do you think? Right? That, that, that's always the difficulty about like online lectures is that you, you can't just drag someone in front of the board and say, well, you do the assignment, right? 
which is one of my favorite things. I, I know students hate it. When I was a student, I also hated it a lot. Um, so, um, no one, no, no guesses on, on how do the parents look for the first crossing scheme? No one? Not even a guess? Like, is it going to be a green plant? Like mice? How do you mean, like mice? Like dragging mice in front of a classroom? Or like pink? All right. At least my moderator answers. And she's not even studying biology. So yeah, of course, like you can, you can see it in the diagram, right? If you have a white allele and you get a red allele, then you are pink, right? So you have two different alleles. The alleles are working together, right? So they mix together. So the parent in this situation will be pink. So for this situation, it is of course different. So in this situation, both parents um, will be red. Right? Because the red is the dominant phenotype. So if a plant is red, but it has, it has so if, if, if you as a mother have a white allele of the gene and you have a red allele of the gene, then of course a white allele combined with a red allele means that you look red. So it's just an understanding question, right? So it's just like, okay, so can you guys reason about what's going on in, in the phenotype? And I never saw anyone ask this question. And I, I would have loved to get this question when I was starting out with genetics. Because everyone knows the crossing scheme. Everyone knows the AA, AB, and, and 25, 50, 25, right? That's the Mendel thing. And, but you have to really think about what is the implication of the state of certain alleles together for the phenotype of an individual. So depending if something is additive or something is dominant, the parents will look different, right? Because a, a, the, the white and the red allele combined in a dominant system where red is dominant will mean that the parents are red. While here, because we have an additive inheritance system, it will mean that the parents are pink. Good. Is this clear? Any remarks? Any like, ooh, that's so surprising, or that's so boring, I knew this. Yeah. All right. Good. All right, so that's Mendel, right? So that was Mendel's big theory, and that's why everyone nowadays still remembers Gregor Mendel, because he did this with different types of seed peas, um, and his peas had um, um, different colors and shapes, and he would cross them together, and then he figured out indeed that there are additive phenotypes and there are dominant phenotypes. So in 1917 we made or someone made an observation um, and Mendelian inherit inheritance breaks down, right? So we, we discovered a phenotype which did not adhere to the rules that Gregor Mendel posed, right? Because Gregor Mendel posed every time that you take two parents, um, you mix them together, you will get these ratios. But Thomas Hunt Morgan, um, image here, he figured out or he had the observation when he was working on Drosophila that some phenotypes are only observed in one of the sexes. So for example, some phenotypes never occur in male Drosophila while in female Drosophila they do. And that is completely against Mendel's rules, right? Because Mendel just said, well, everyone has two alleles. You get one from your father, one from your mother, they mix together. And of course, we now know that this is of course not true because we know that you have autosomes and you have sex chromosomes, right? So there are chromosomes which determine which sex you have. And of course, on these chromosomes, there's also genes located. And of course, these genes, they follow a different pattern. Because if you're a female, you get the X chromosome from your mother and the X chromosome from your father. But if you are, yeah, so there's, there's three possibilities. You can get the X chromosome number one from your mother, X chromosome number two from your mother, so that's your first one. And then the second one will always be the X chromosome from your father, who your father got from his, his mother. But for the Y chromosome, that, that doesn't work that way. So for the Y chromosome, hey, you always, that gets passed from father to son to, to 
son of the sun and these kinds of things. So not only did he observe that some phenotypes seem to be only in one of the sexes, he also observed that some phenotypes seem to be connected together, right? Because if you, if, you, if you take not just one phenotype, like the color of the plant, but you take like four or five of them, then you start noticing that some phenotypes tend to occur more together, right? Being red and having a wrinkly, uh, wrinkly eye or having red eyes and, and weird wings on Drosophila than, than other phenotypes. And this is a massive advancement in genetics because we had no idea about chromosomes, right? DNA, we didn't know anything about DNA in 1917. The discovery of DNA is like 50 years later. Um, we didn't even know that there was something like nucleic acid, which was the carrier of genetic information. Yeah, but he already said, no, there has to be something which he called a chromosome on which these things are located. So instead of having like one string with beads on there, like Mendel thought, it actually, he prosed and said, no, there's a, there's a discrete number of these strings, each with the beads or each with the genes on there, but you have multiple of these strings and you get two strings. So one from your father and one from your mother. Um, and like not just for chromosome one, but also for chromosome two and for chromosome three. So and it, this is a massive, massive advancement and, and using his theory of the chromosomes and of linkage so that two phenotypes occur together, like I showed you also in the cows, right? Because in the cows, we know that if it's white and black and it has like, then it's probably a milk cow. And that is because the, the color of the cow, so the black and white coloring is on the same chromosome as the milk production trait. So high milk production is very close on the chromosome. So the genes causing higher milk production are very close to the genes controlling the color of the cow. So hey, using this theory of chromosomes and linkage, Thomas Hunt Morgan started mapping Mendelian phenotypes back to its to their genome, right? So he posed the idea there are chromosomes and you have an, an, a discrete number of chromosomes and this he called the genome. Right? And, and how did he do this? Well, he did this by measuring traits in parents and offsprings and then calculating the co-occurrence between different phenotypes in the offspring generation. And now we say that if two phenotypes are linked together, like uh, the color of the cow and the milk yield, then we call these two phenotypes linked. And the units of how, how strongly they are linked is called organ. And we generally don't use Morgans, but generally we use centimorgans, so one hundredth of a Morgan, because a Morgan is generally a whole chromosome. All right, so one of the experiments that he did was this experiment, and so in Drosophila, when we think about these little fruit flies, right, then in Drosophila there is a gene which is controlling your white eye, right, so that is called the W gene. And there is a gene for miniature wings, so small wings on the Drosophila, so M. And both of these genes are located on the X chromosome, so they are located on the X sex chromosome. So what did he do? So he crossed white miniature females, so females with miniature wings, so that is, um, so it's white miniature, white miniature, right? So these individuals have, um, and then he crossed them with a wild type male. So the wild type male, of course, has a normal eye, a black eye in Drosophila called W plus, and he has normal wings, which is M plus. And of course, he has a Y chromosome. So there's no second side to the genome, right? So here we see WM, which means that on the first X chromosome, you are white eyed, small wings. On the second X chromosome, you are white eyed, small wings. Well, the males that he crossed them with actually had normal eyes, normal, um, uh, normal wings and a Y chromosome. So he did an F1 cross, which means that you take two of these individuals and you cross them together. And then he observed that the males were white eyed with miniature wings and females were both uh, were wild type for both eye color and wing size. So they were showing this inheritance pattern. Right. So now my question to you guys is, is this a dominant phenotype 
or is this an additive phenotype? Based on what we just discussed with the inheritance diagrams. So there's two possible answers, and so just throw one in chat. You don't even have to type the whole word. Just say D for dominance or A for additive. And I like that because, like, my name's Danny Alden, so you can just say D-A. So. <laughs> but, yeah, so question here. Is there dominance or is there additivity going on here? So you see that it's not as easy as just looking at the diagrams and thinking, oh, I understand how this diagram works. And it's a little bit sneaky because I haven't shown you a second or a, a two, um, two phenotype inheritance diagram. So... Is eye color and wing size, is that dominant or additive? I'm just going to do a... I, I am going to use the, the cricket sound then uh, while we wait. Yeah. Like normally I would point to someone. Like Genie88, dominant or additive, go. Or am I not getting the chat at all at the moment? A, Sam West says additive. Beacon says additive. Very good, very good. Then we stop the cricket sound. It's dominant. So how do you know it's dominant? Right? Because here it says that females were wild type for both eye color and wing size. But their, their genotype is having W+, plus, M+, plus, W, and M. Right, so they didn't have like gray eyes, right? Because the mixture between white and black would be gray eyes. And between miniature wings and normal wings would be kind of half-sized wings, right? But because the females have normal eyes and normal wings, we know that the W plus allele, so the wing, uh, the, the eye allele right so the w allele so the allele for standard eyes is dominating the white eye allele because if it would be a combination right then the, the w plus plus a w would create gray eyes the m right so the the wings if you would have a normal wing combined with a small wing then the additive model would say that you have like half a wing right so not small not big but in the middle so this is a clear phenotype dominance thing, right? Um, and of course, the males here don't provide us any information because they only have one copy of each of the genes. So they only have one copy. While females have two copies, so here we can determine based on the females, because it's a sex-length op op uh, sex uh, phenotype, we can determine that in the females we can see they are normal. Um, so because they are normal, they have to have gotten half of their genome from the mother, half of the genome from the father. So you would expect a mixture if it was additive, but there's no mixture. All right. Let's make it a little bit more difficult, right? So here we are doing an F1 interbreeding with X-linked genes. So all of these genes, the genes for the eyes, the genes for the wings are link located on the X chromosome. And we call males hemizygous recessive, right? And what does hemizygous mean? Hemizygous means that we only have one copy of a gene or DNA sequence in a diploid cell. So normally, for every gene, you have two copies, one from your father, one from your mother. But if you are a male, then on the X chromosome, or on your sex chromosome, because you only get one X chromosome from your mother, and this X chromosome, or the genes on the X chromosome from your mother are not comparable to the, X, or to the Y chromosome that you get from your father, because the Y chromosome is more or less a stub. It, it has almost no genes on there. So you know, on the X chromosome, the X chromosome is one of the biggest chromosomes generally, so it's almost as big as chromosome 1. So it literally has thousands of genes on there. 
but the Y chromosome only has like four or five real genes on there. So, and these are not homologous to the genes that are on the X chromosome. So, for, um, uh, okay, just ignore the phone. Um, so we call this hemizygous. So hemizygous means that you are a diploid organism. So you have two copies of, of normal genes. Um, but as a male, in this case, you have only one copy. Right, so um, hemizygous recessive means that you always pass on the recessive allele to daughters and no X-linked alleles to your son. Right, and this is, in, this is very important when we talk about phenotype causing diseases that are linked to the X chromosome. Because as a male, you only have one X chromosome. So if you get a copy of a gene which is broken, then of course you will always transfer this broken copy to your daughter, but you won't to your, to your, to your son, right? Because your son gets the Y chromosome and your daughter always gets your X chromosome. Um, let me just answer this very quickly. I'm very sorry about that. I tell people that I have a lecture, but then they still start calling me. So I will be right back. I am very sorry. I'm, I'm back. Um, the problem is, is uh, about the phone thing is we got voice over IP phones, new ones here in the office, and they changed all of our numbers. And now everyone who wants to call the laboratory is actually calling me, which is just a pain. It's just a pain. I get so many phone calls, but they're not for me. And I like getting phone calls that are for me. All right, so is this clear that, that males are hemizygous recessive, meaning that hey, if you are a male, and you get a daughter, then the daughter automatically gets your X chromosome. And if you are a, um, um, if you are a, uh, if you are a, a, a son, then of course the son gets the X chromosome. Time for a break. Um, yeah, yeah. Why not? Why not? Why not? We're at slide 23 of 75, so I was actually planning to do two more, um, but I can I can use a break as well. Um, so yeah, let's go to the break. Um, I changed the small animated GIF things. I think we are going to do capybaras in the first break, but don't don't pin that on me if it's not capybaras. Um, so if you guys want any like sound or music as well, um, otherwise it will just be silent, which is perfectly fine for me. But um, you, you can friend shaped yes, friend shaped animals this time. All right, at least I will stop the recording.